My name is Jane Burke. As you have heard during the last quarter, I retired from Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco as an IT executive. I am bringing my network of formal colleagues to speak to the series. This series for, the series for this quarter is on demystifying IT. Many of us have relatives or friends who work in the information technology field. And the, the term IT has evolved over the years, starting from programming, data processing, automation, and today we call it IT. IT is massive and IT activities may appear very mysterious to many of us. According to Gartner, a global leading research and advisory company, information technology is the common term for the entire spectrum of technologies for information processing, including software, hardware, communication, and the related services. This quarter, the speaker series will try to demystify IT by focusing on what IT is and what IT professionals do. We are inviting guest speakers from the banking or technology industry to talk about people, process, and technology. It intends to open the eyes of curious minds and connect common technology terms to our day-to-day -day activities. Today's topic is on design thinking. What is design thinking and why? And design thinking is a process, a methodology, as well as an approach before an IT professional attempts to solve a problem. Why? Because it centers on human behavior and connects with human emotions. Today, I'm excited to have our first guest speaker, Brian St. John. He will explain what an IT professional do with design thinking. Brian is a design leader and the user experience manager who believes that creative confidence and relentless curiosity are the core mindsets that unlock new possibilities and ways to connect with people. In his role at Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, Brian has demonstrated a tireless drive to make things better for business partners and cross-functional teams. He is an expert design leader, and he is both an IT professional, an artist, and a designer. And it is fitting for Brian to facilitate today's discussion. His view and perspective represent those of his, not the organization he worked for. And before I turn over to Brian for further introduction, I just want to remind all to please mute and raise your hand if you have questions or comments. You're welcome to change your screen name on Zoom. And if you have questions or if we, if we do not have time today for questions, we will reserve, we will have a special time during the open lab on Friday, April 29th. And that's when we will follow up with Q&A, comments and discussions. Now, let me turn over to Brian to introduce himself as well as starting today's session. Brian. All right, thank you, Jane. Uh, Want to just check that you could see my screen and all that's ready to go? Yes, I can oh. see it. All right, excellent. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Brian Spencer St. John, and uh, Jane did a great job introducing me. I'm one of her network at the Federal Reserve, uh, formerly. Um, I'm currently with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'd like to give you a quick overview of today's talk. It'll be interactive. I'll be sharing a link with you in the chat, so uh, uh, stay tuned for that. It's completely optional if you'd like to participate. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, but first, I want to give you a quick broad overview of today's talk. So one, I'll tell you who am I? Who, who am I is actually a uh, code for those of you that used to be in technology, you could enter in that command and you could get a return from the system on your identity and who you are. So I'll give you an overview and a little background about myself here in a minute. Um, I'll give you an overview of design thinking and how we're using it at the Federal Reserve Bank and a little of my background as both an artist, a designer, and now a design leader. I'll also give you 
an overview of the fundamentals around design thinking and what is encompassed in it and what it's all about and how you could start using it. And then, like I said, I want this to be participatory. So I'll be sharing the link with you uh, here shortly. Feel free to move around the board, interact with the board. Um, it's not too complicated, um, but I'll be walking you through every bit of the way. So you could pretty much have hands-free for the large majority and you'll be able to uh, watch along with this. And then you'll get a try. I wanna hear from you and learn from you. So we'll actually do some design thinking today at the very end. And you'll, you'll have an opportunity to participate and hopefully the activity that, that I have in store for you, uh, it'll give you a, a great vision for your next year uh, here with, with, with everyone. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Brian, as I mentioned, um, and I believe that uh, curiosity, creativity and experimentation are really core uh, components to what I'm about and what we're doing in IT. We're, we're using tools such as the HoloLens and other technologies to really innovate and spark new ideas for how we make sense of large data uh, objects, data complexities, abstractions. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that more a little later on. Uh, so who am I? Um, well, I'm an artist, and uh, because because you didn't ask, um, you know, uh, my portfolio is on this on this board here. You could check that out. Um, and if you look at this little illustration here, um, when I first started as an artist, um, <laughs> a lot of people thought of me a little differently. And my my dad, for one. I uh, thought, you know, I was kind of like, uh, you know, that playful guy, just la da 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 da, daydreaming and having fun. Um, what my mom thought I did was just making a mess uh, and, and on and on. So at the very core of who I am, uh, you can see the, the easel back behind me. Um, I started off as an artist, illustrator. And so I have a, a very, very deep background in the visual arts and, and love to do this work. And in fact, a, a lot of what I do now uh, translates directly into design thinking and, and what, we're, what, we're, what we're doing here. Um, I love this quote by Picasso. He says, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. And what this simply means is um, the, the act of art, we think of like Picasso and Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, but, but an artist, if you think about it, at its core is a curious person. And I believe that we could all be curious no matter how old we are. Um, it's, it's being engaged with other people, uh, other environments. And I think that's, that's what Picasso meant here is that, that curiosity, that problem solving, the sort of how to uh, express ourselves and how to bring new things into life. Uh, so I have a website out there if you'd like to learn more about me, uh, and I have uh, my bio down here. And, um, <clears throat> and I wanted to share a little bit about um, why unreserved. So as, as Jane mentioned, you know, we both come from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And one of the things that we've been promoting as an organization is being unreserved. So we are called the Federal Reserve. But reserve kind of means like you're you're kind of almost set in your ways. You're a little more you know uh, conservative about your view and 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 the world around you. And I captured these notes here around what reserve unreserved means to us. Really, the way the bank is looking at unreserved is people's lives, people's jobs, people's neighborhoods, and really creating an atmosphere and culture where we could do all these things. On pick out a few here, um, just looking for opportunities for everybody um, and how we as a public service organization can really do our very best to demonstrate service leadership to our communities and the people around us. Um, we want to be unreserved in the way we keep pace with innovation. So design thinking is a tool in our toolkit that we're using uh, to really unlock innovation and unlock potential. Um, design thinking also provides a way in which we could build genuine relationships and have courageous conversations about the world around us. And then, of course, we're all about our mission, the Federal Reserve mission, um, and, and design thinking and a number of other tools really help us uh, in that regard. 
So we have a lot to cover today. Um, I think at this point, I'm going to just uh, uh, pass it back over to Jane. Um, I'm just, you know, wanting to pass it back over to you really quick before we do uh, the full the full deep dive. And I think we want this to be interactive with Q and A. So, so that's my quick quick intro there, Jane. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for the for the introduction. Uh, we currently have 25 people joining the session and uh, and Brian is sharing the full board of what he's going to cover. You will have a chance to join interactively uh, with this board. I just want to quickly check everybody is able to see the board. Yes, I saw the hand signal. Uh, so go ahead, Brian, I'll pass it back to you. Um, by the way, Brian just pasted a link from Brian to everyone, a link to this board. And you can click on this, uh, this link to join the board interactively as a visitor. You don't need to have a credential. You don't need to have an account. You just need to click on the link and join as a visitor. That's right, that's right. And, and thank you, Jane. And so I understand today is the first uh, session in the spring quarter. And Jane and I actually had uh, an opportunity to meet in San Francisco recently. I just flew back last night, uh, visited the San Francisco Bay Area, and I lived out there for a number of years. And so I was glad to connect, reconnect with Jane. It's been almost two years, right, Jane? Yeah. Uh, so, so we had a chance to have dinner and I met her, her two little lovely kittens. And the, I'm sure they're not kittens anymore. Uh, Spencer and Maxwell. Uh, I have two small uh, Yorkies of my own, Milo and Piper. And so I'm really excited to be uh, here to kick off this first session for the spring quarter. And in our conversations, uh, Jane asked me to talk about design thinking. So that's exactly what uh, today is about. And it's my intent to help demystify what this is and what it means for IT and really show how uh, through my primary job as a UX manager, how our team is using this and how we're really sharing these techniques with a variety of other uh, leaders in our organizations and a number of other engineers and designers in the field. So design thinking at its core is, is a way to connect with the human. It's a human-centered design practice. It connects with people's uh, behaviors, emotions, attitudes, um, and, and all those things. So this is something you can incorporate even in your role as, uh, from what I've learned, retirees. So I'm going to show you how to use this from a retiree perspective. It's really for a bunch of things. Anywhere there's a human at a center, it's for you. Um, so I'll answer the question around what is design thinking and, and many, other, uh, many other topics. But to get us started, so I'm going to kick us off with the video here. So if you could direct your- Apple Business Essentials your, is here. Your screen at the video. Sorry for the commercial. <laughs> Start your free trial now. When companies set strategy, they often stumble. Either they collect a lot of backward-looking data, which doesn't tell them what future customers really want, or they make risky bets based on instinct instead of evidence. Design thinking is a strategy-making process that avoids these mistakes by applying tools from the world of design and shifting the focus to human behavior. Popularized by David M. Kelly and Tim Brown of IDEO and Roger Martin of the Rotman School, design thinking has three major stages. First, invent a future. Form a few theories about what customers might want but don't have by immersing yourself in their lives. Instead of polling them about specific products or services, observe and ask questions about their behavior. Next, test your ideas out. Use iterative prototyping with good enough products or services and conduct a few quick experiments to see how consumers respond. Adjust the product, the pricing, or the positioning accordingly. Finally, bring the new product or service to life. When you've got a winner, identify the activities, capabilities, and resources your company will need to actually produce, distribute, and sell it. For example, when senior managers at Procter & Gamble wanted to turn around the skincare brand Oil of Olay, they began by observing shoppers in both mass retail channels and high-end department stores. They realized that their industry had been primarily targeting women over 50 who were worried about wrinkles, while pretty much ignoring those in their 30s and 40s who were concerned about other issues. 
this was a huge market to be captured. So P&G experimented with new formulations that would tackle multiple skincare goals, then tested different prototypes, price points, and store displays. Finally, the company launched a series of new premium, yet broadly distributed, products that were well received by a wide range of consumers. By using imaginative, human-centered problem solving, design thinking can help you unlock new markets and identify new strategies. All right, excellent. So I thought that was a great video to kick us off. Um, so let's zoom back out. And let's, uh, let's start off with our first activity. All right, so if you have a pen and paper, I would like for you to take about uh, one minute to complete the drawing correctly. So just take a, a piece of paper, if you have one handy, a pen, and complete the drawing correctly. And Jane, I might ask for your help here. Uh, I'm gonna stay sharing the screen here, uh, but I'd be curious to see after about a minute or so, uh, if folks can volunteer and share their picture that they, that they did. So about another 30 seconds, it's a quick activity. There's no, I mean, you do wanna com complete it correctly. Uh, that's important, but um, no judgment. All right, I'm showing about one minute now. Uh, Jane, can you take a quick look around on camera, see if folks can hold their drawing up to the camera? How are they looking? Let's see, let's see if I see any. All right, all right, I see a couple. Sorry, I was trying to figure out Zoom here. Great job, great job. So the reason the reason I share this activity and I, I have a link here that, that you'll be able to get to later on, uh, but the way we show up as leaders, um, even those of you that are retired, like we're, we're all still leaders and even in the organization, we demonstrate our own design leadership and that's what this to topic is about and, and around design thinking. When we phrase things in a way that limits creativity, that's the result that we will get. We'll get a, a reduced amount of creativity. Um, and the video that I'll share um, after the session, uh, this was conducted amongst uh, very young children and they would get a point if they drew this, this thing correctly. And most of the children created a house. They created a little box down below, a little chimney, and they perceive that to be the correct way to complete the drawing. But when we take out the word correctly and just leave it as complete the drawing, what uh, teachers saw was that the resulting creativity went up exponentially. They saw just an improved amount of creativity. And from a leadership perspective, um, that collaborative and the way we frame our um, our, um, the way we conduct ourselves great, uh, matters greatly. Um, so I'm gonna see about, I know a lot of you are, are here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take control, there we go. That way you could see what I'm seeing. And so in IT, in our organization, we've seen a transformation of different leadership styles throughout the years. Um, I'm a big proponent of collaborative leadership and that's what I think of as design leadership. That's a big part of it. And in design leadership, this is where we look for more participation from a number of different people, different perspectives, different backgrounds. And uh, there's a Harvard Business Review link there that uh, you could check out later. Um, and then that video that I mentioned, uh, you'll see that it's, that it's over here uh, and available to you on YouTube. Um, I'd like to share another video that I think really helps demonstrate um, you all would have used lifts thinking. and ever wondered why all lift elevators have mirrors. Let us find out the reason behind having these mirrors in this video. In the early industrial age, 
many of the new buildings being built taller than anything ever built before, and most had lifts. As buildings got taller and taller, more people began to use lifts, but as they were quite slow, people were constantly complaining. Lift companies were challenged with this problem, and came up with the typical problem statement, lifts move too slow. So they went off to design lifts that were faster and safer, but at the time it was very expensive to do so. Then based on an engineer's idea, instead of concentrating on larger motors, slicker pulley designs and such, they concentrated on the passenger in the lift. This led to lots of customer research. They found that a lot of people thought the elevators were a lot slower than they actually were. They also discovered that people had an exaggerated sense of time because they had nothing to do but stare at the wall and think about the safety of the elevator being suspended in the air and preoccupied with the fear of falling. This lead to the idea of mirrors and lifts, so people would think about something else besides danger and slowness. Instead, they could see if their hair looked okay, if their tie was straight, if they needed to touch up their lipstick etc. By installing mirrors in the elevators, people became distracted and were no longer preoccupied with the fear of falling. On a follow-up survey, customers commented how much faster the new lifts were even though the speed was exactly the same. The lift design itself had not changed at all, just people's perception of the speed. So all lifts by design have mirrors installed in them. Other reasons that mirrors will help are 1. Mirrors help to give the optical illusion of the lift being larger than it is, which helps some people who have claustrophobia to deal with their journey within the box. 2. The purpose of having mirrors within the lift is to allow you to see what everyone is doing. If they are planning to assault or rob you, you will at least have forewarning and a short amount of time to prepare yourself accordingly. Hope you enjoyed this video. All right. And I really like that video because, you know, they, 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 there was a problem. There was a hypothesis that, you know, we needed to learn why the users felt that it was slow, why they felt that it was taking longer than what they expected. And, you know, through that design thinking was, uh, done and conducted to understand the human need. And that's exactly what design thinking is, is it's a way to uh, take a human centered approach uh, to understanding the pain points around the user. And so that's actually a great segue into um, the science and the underlying mindsets uh, behind design thinking and understanding user behavior. And that's exactly what the lift in the elevator, the mirrors in the elevator had to do was there's a behavior in the elevator that they really wanted to solve for and better understand. So these six behaviors actually come from uh, Luma Institute. I've, I've cited the, um, the um, person that shared it with me. Um, and there's really six behaviors that um, you could begin to uh, explore further. Uh, the first one is around iteration and being iterative. So very, very much like the elevator lift, I would imagine that many tests and many hypotheses were evaluated over time. Um, and, and iterative is one of these things that um, is, is something that repeats over and over and over. You, it, there's, there's a lot of relation uh, to the scientific method in design thinking. And what that means is um, there's a hypothesis. You test that hypothesis through experimentation, through data collection, and then you see if your hypothesis is correct. Um, in IT, uh, for those of you that have been in IT for, for years now, um, we have have created like user stories or requirements, and we've, we've thrown them over to a development or engineering team and hope, hope we get it right. Um, but through design thinking, what, what you do is you, you shrink that feedback loop, condense it, and do it more quickly so that you're reducing um, costs, mitigating risks, et cetera. So the ultimate goal is to have an increase of love and a improved performance in time. Uh, the next behavior has to do with questioning. So questioning is a mindset that you want with design thinking. And what that means is you're asking the question, why? Uh, kind of like that nagging toddler. I don't know how many of you all have uh, young grandchildren, but why, 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 why? Uh, design thinking is all about this, asking why. And the way it's uh, segmented is through 
looking at the problem and then looking at the solution and separating those things out. Oftentimes um, we, we have ideas, we have great ideas and we want to jump straight into solution. But what I found through practice is that we really need to understand that problem space. And to do that, there's, there's, there's a, a discovery phase and this is where we do divergent thinking. And then once we have lots of ideas out there, then we begin to narrow down or converge and further define what the real problem is. And that's where you get the initial problem. Then you do divergence again, uh, where you create lots of options. And that can be uh, viewed as, as design. And then when you have lots of options to choose from, then you could begin to make those choices that are going to meet and deliver the, uh, the business needs or whatever outcomes you're working on. And that's where you get into the solution. But it all starts with that question, why? Um, the next behavior has to do with imaginate. And what that is, is taking real to abstract uh, concepts into the current state versus a future state. So we follow this, this uh, curved circle around uh, that discovery. So I talked about discovery just a second ago. Uh, then we get into define, we get into design, and then we deliver. So um, we're taking these very tangible things and these very abstract things and, and converging them together. Uh, next has to do with uh, empathetic experiences. And what that is, is, is really has to do with your bottom line. So this is definitely a more business-minded um, uh, behavior here, uh, just around what makes you and your product, your service, your strategy different. And differentiated products are the ones that will thrive in the market that will really provide the most optimal value for not only the business, but for, for the end user. Once you understand sort of that idealized uh, experience, then you could back your way into the service, into the product, and then into the technology. Um, what we're seeing in technology, things are moving so quickly and rapidly that we have to be able to swap these things out uh, in a very agile way over time. But what is ultimately like the highest value is that experience that you're giving to your, to the human, the person that's actually using your, your tools and services and products. Um, design thinking, another mindset and, and behavior has to do with collaborative. Um, so on the left-hand side, you'll see a, a little person uh, that has an idea. It's a little square and that's it. It's a square, but over on the right, you could have multiple people, multiple perspectives. And when one person thinks of the side, one person thinks of the top and the other person thinks of the other side, then you have like a three dimensional box. And through that collaboration, you're actually making things better uh, as a team. And then the last behavior has to do with being visual. Um, so we spend a lot of time talking like I am now, but in design thinking, you're actually putting form to your thoughts and uh, creating things that people can see and understand. The idea is that we have an idea in our head here, like the person on the left has an idea of a truck and that person thinks it's like a big 18 wheeler. The other person, when they hear the word truck, they think of like a pickup truck. And in our minds, we have our own ideas about what the world looks like and, and what, it, what it is about. When we actually visualize these things, we help really enhance uh, our understanding of, of our world around us. So let's uh, get to the fundamentals of, of design thinking. And so I wanna start us off with, with, uh, with the origin story of design thinking. And I've, I've had a lot of little, little images here to make it fun. I don't know if there's any fans of the Lion King out here, uh, but that's, uh, uh, you know, that's when they show that the king is born. Uh, so this is the origin story. So design thinking is actually, has been around for a number of years at, and I, I have a, a little slide here, it's really small and I have links to all this. But design thinking actually comes to us uh, many, many years ago, back in, as far back from what I've read uh, back in the early 50s. And it really has its roots around design science and the study of ergonomics. Um, and certainly there's more links that you can read about this. And it's, it's actually evolved quite a bit over time. Um, it's become uh, more popular uh, and more mainstream nowadays uh, through the likes of the Stanford D School, um, IDEO, um, MIT has a program, IBM has been a big proponent of design thinking um, as of the last, I would say, 10 years or so. 
uh, but it's been, really been around for a long time. Um, and my background, as I shared earlier, uh, having a, an arts background in, in the visual arts and graphic design, um, this is actually taught in art school, uh, not design thinking as sort of a methodology, but the creative process is what artists know it as uh, and designers know it as. And I really like this quote here from Steve Jobs on the left hand side. I won't read the whole thing, but he, he's talking about how cre what creativity is and, and what that really means. And to, to paraphrase slightly, creativity is really the idea of connecting things. It's, it's the idea of having lots of experiences to pull from. And through those experiences and, and through living life, uh, that's where we could draw new connections and, and mash up and bring to bear new things. Um, another, uh, what I would call like um, origin story has to do with David Sibbett. Um, and and I, there's a link here to, the, to this uh, book and many other books. Um, I actually was very fortunate to meet uh, David Sibbett uh, at, the, at the San Francisco Fed uh, several years ago, um, along with Tom Kelly as well. He's an author of, of um, Creative Confidence. Um, but David Sibbett actually had some early time with Steve Jobs and facilitated graphic recordings of some of the leadership meetings that, that uh, Apple was having many, many years ago. Uh, so, so these are some two origins of design thinking. And the key thing here is, again, going visual, making things visual, um, sort of translating what's in your mind and in your imagination through the participation of others, uh, creating new form of those ideas. So I'd like to jump over to this next video where we'll learn um, how to solve problems like a designer. And done. Love how this design turned out. All right, Ava, bring on your developer. This is the first Apple computer mouse. It came with Apple's $10,000 Lisa computer, and it was designed by a product design consulting firm that would eventually become known as IDEO. The assignment was straightforward. They had to take the computer mouse, a $400 device at the time, and bring it down to under 35 bucks, make it mass producible and reliable. And above all, it needed to be simple. We control Lisa by pointing to these images on the screen with this unique item called a mouse. Fast forward about 30 years, and IDEO doesn't really create products anymore. They've transitioned to designing networks and experiences, things like Los Angeles' voting system and the Red Cross's method for finding donors, even entire schools. So what does making a computer mouse have to do with creating a school system from scratch? It turns out, quite a lot. The world we live in is one where really the complex things are the things that are mostly broken, not the simple things. We have lots of great products, uh, lots of beautiful products, lots of products we can use every day. Everything from you know furniture to, to, to tableware to consumer electronics, they're mostly pretty good, right? They're, and yes, there's opportunity to do better and do more, but I'm interested in the things that don't work very well and the things that you can impact society with. And they're mostly the more complex things. Back in 1971, a designer named Victor Papenick wrote a book called Design for the Real World. The premise was pretty simple. Creators could take some of the same design strategies from the creation of industrial products and use them to tackle problems like pollution and overcrowding and food shortages. By 2001, IDEO had done just that, pivoting from products to real world experiences. But the design steps? Tim Brown says they say just about the same. The first piece is observing the world in order to ask an interesting question, right? I mean, and you can observe the world in lots of different ways. When we talk about human-centered design, we're really talking about observing the way humans live their lives and asking interesting questions about, hey, why does somebody do this and not that? Or why is somebody struggling with this problem? Why, why is it hard for somebody to open that uh, uh, struggle? Are they, why are they struggling to open that jam jar lid? Well, so maybe I could redesign the jam jar lid, right? Or maybe I could give them a tool to help them, right? So. So why is this happening? So the first step is that uh, looking at the world and coming up with a good question. For making a mouse, that means watching how people use computers and observing what they want and what they don't. 
For designing a school, that meant spending a month in Peru, meeting with students and parents, teachers, investors, government and business leaders, to address needs like academic planning, modular classroom space, accessible technology, and affordable tuition. The next step is taking all the insights you have about those questions and starting to imagine ideas, like here's what I could do, here's what I might imagine doing better or differently. So that's what we often call ideation or idea making. Then comes the fun part. You test it out. Right at the beginning of the process, that might be a really simple cardboard model or a quick sketch, or if it's digital, it might be a quick digital simulation or something. And you try it out with people. Sometimes those drafts can be pretty rough. The first prototype for the mouse was a roll-on deodorant stick and a butter dish from a Palo Alto Walgreens. And you test it and see, is it, and it doesn't work. Okay, so I need to rethink my idea and I do it again, right? And this is where the iteration comes in, right? You, you learn from the prototype, you realize what's not working, or maybe it's a crummy idea, you have to go back and find a new idea again. And you go through that loop over and over again, asking the question, having ideas, prototyping, learning, and, and until you get to something that truly meets somebody's needs or a set of people's needs. Now the only, the, the last bit of the process which, which arguably happens in that iteration also is the storytelling piece, right? Because always you're trying to explain to people why, you're, why your idea is interesting. Macintosh, the computer for the rest of us. I think what you need to design a complex system is not one brain, you need lots of brains. You need lots of brains with different perspectives, different creative contributions that they make, working together to get to an outcome that is that is literally rich enough and sophisticated enough to be able to behave like a system instead of being like an object. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that one there. Um, so let's move on to some new concepts. Um, call what I'm calling beyond the brain. Um, so in our world today, uh, and I'm hoping you're liking the mix of the videos and, and, and conversation here, um, but understanding and learning are at the core of design thinking. So uh, learning from your user, having a human centric approach to understanding their needs, uh, but learning and understanding happen uh, beyond the brain. So I'd really encourage this audience to take a look at Steven Anderson. He's the, he's the guy with the puzzle, the uh, Lego blocks on the right. Um, we had him at a workshop last year. Uh, super great guy. Um, uh, re recently published Figure It Out, um, where he talks a lot about these concepts. And so the idea of beyond the brain, what that means is that in order to enhance the way we learn and understand, in, in history and, and even in our adolescent upbringing, we've learned that through play, we could learn more about our world, more about each other, and more about how to solve complex problems. So on the left, you'll see a chess player uh, moving pieces. So, you know, learning and understanding are actually happening at your fingertips by moving uh, your pieces across the board and imaginating uh, what the outcome of that move might mean to you or not, or, or may not mean to you. Um, playing cards, flipping cards, making strategies of what is behind the card and what your opponent might be thinking, right, through observation. Uh, there's tic-tac-toe over, over to the left where, you know, moving, moving shapes and pieces around have meaning uh, beyond, you know, just what they mean on the surface. So models such as like a business canvas model uh, which you're seeing uh, on this screen as well. Moving these pieces around take on different form and different meaning. And so these, these, these ways of plays and these canvases and models and these visuals really help deepen the way we learn and understand uh, the world around us. Uh, we could use whiteboards. So you see a, digital, uh, a whiteboard there. We're on a digital whiteboard right now. And so in our, in our modern time right now, um, using as many of these tools to increase our understanding about each other, the world around us is going to be uh, very, very critical. Uh, but more than meets the eye. So I'm a Transformers fan. Uh, <laughs> uh, grew up with Transformers as a young boy. Um, and so you've heard about design thinking from the invention of a mouse, mirrors in an elevator. But show of hands, how many of you all are uh, designing elevators or designing mouse? Probably not many of you. Um, but 
what what more than meets the eye means is if you're designing your retirement, you could actually use design thinking, and we'll get to that toward the end. Um, but in the Fed, we're we're using design thinking to look at how we imagine our financial services, um, how we're productizing them, all the different systems and operations that support them. Um, we use design thinking to look at operations. So we have uh, a cash operations environment. Uh, we have other operations environment around project management and other disciplines. Um, so design thinking can be used for that. Um, our executive leadership teams across the organization are looking for new innovative ways to um, broaden the way we, we, we view uh, the country, the American people. Uh, like I said, um, we're a public service organization. So um, tapping into that human-centered design approach is very important to the way we, we think about where we're going. And of course, the future, the future could be the future of technology, the future of just um, our, our economy and, and our world. Um, I'm definitely not an economist, so I can't speak to that, but uh, definitely through a human-centered approach, design thinking is a great tool for imagining what the future might look like. Uh, personally, within our group, we've applied um, design thinking towards uh, diversity, equity, inclusion efforts inside our organizations. Uh, we've used design thinking for business relationship management, and this could be used as a way to promote, story tell um, why your business matters, why you're so important. We've used design thinking with our leadership groups, uh, management groups. Uh, in fact, if, if you're a people manager or a leader, you could use design thinking to better understand those that you're serving and those that you're engaging with. I also view design thinking as a way to differentiate yourselves because when you use design thinking, you could really thrive and um, do great to be a more collaborative leader, design leader, as I've called it, um, to be more inclusive of multitude of backgrounds, perspectives, and really make those connections that Steve Jobs mentioned in that quote that I shared uh, with you, all with the end mind and the outcome around optimizing learning and understanding. So right now we're in a remote um, session, right? We're on Zoom. You're seeing me through a video camera. Hopefully the audio and video are coming, coming across really well. Um, we're kind of moving into a hybrid mode right now. Um, I was in person in San Francisco recently and I was facilitating a workshop and there was some people that were remote. And so hybrid is here to stay. And what that means is we're gonna have a blended way of interacting with people around the world uh, in our economies. And so the way I kind of view this is um, the PC is equal to me. Uh, so this is an older PC, of course. And what's emerging is XR technology. And that's an umbrella term to be inclusive of augmented reality, virtual realities. And I believe Jane has a talk that does a deeper dive on this topic. But around design thinking, um, we really think that XR uh, will really offer a great new technology to really satisfy a lot of those hybrid business needs that are likely around the corner from us. And the way I personally view some of these things is again, when, when you think about uh, thinking beyond the brain or um, sort of the other ways that we learn and understand, uh, wouldn't it be great if we could understand our economy, climate risk, supply chain, other things like visually in a more collaborative, immersive way um, so that's, that's what excites me. Uh, I put a link to a YouTube video that, that describes how the economy works. Um, and so imagine being able to visualize uh, these very complex topics and learning and understanding in new ways. At the, at the top of the call, we, 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 we learn uh, about the mirrors, about IDO, um, some of the fundamentals of design thinking. There's tons of material out there around design thinking. Um, and um, I don't know if there's any uh, uh, Disney fans out there, but uh, one, 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 one shoe doesn't fit all, one size doesn't fit all, right? So Stanford D School has their own view of design thinking. IDOU has their own way of thinking. Lean UX has its own way of, of thinking about design thinking. 
Um, Luma Institute has its own way of approaching design thinking. And still further, the British Design Council has its own view around design thinking. My, the point that I'll leave you with is it's, it's not so much process, it's more about your outcomes. So if you remember at the outset, we're looking at problems. We're looking at using design thinking as a problem solving um, um, method to understand human needs. So the outcome that, that you ought to be looking at is what do you wanna make better? And what are those techniques and tools that will help you make the thing better for the people you're, you're serving? So I'd like to jump over to this Principles of Human-Centered Design by Don Norman. The principles of human-centered design apply even if you don't follow the process of human-centered design, because what are the principles? Well, the first one is the be human-centered. Focus upon the people that whatever you're doing is intended for, whether you're doing a service or a product or an organizational structure or a new way of, I don't know, stocking the warehouse or putting things on shelves, whatever you're doing, always think of the people and all the people, not just the people say who are gonna retrieve the items you put in, but the people who have to put the items up there in the first place. And if you're in the healthcare system, you have to think about patients and their families and the physicians and the nurses, and also the medical personnel, and the technicians, and for that matter, even the people who do the scheduling and clean the place. You have to think of it as a system and look at all of the components. So that's the second important thing. Find the right problem. Almost always when somebody gives me a problem to solve, I refuse to solve it. Because it's not the right problem, it's the symptom of the problem. And I want to solve the fundamental basic problem because if I can solve the basic problem, guess what? The symptoms disappear. But that's not always so easy and it can take a lot of time. And even though I argue strongly, you should always try to solve the fundamental root problem. Sometimes it's okay just to solve the symptoms. And finally, you have to think of everything as a system. Everything is interconnected. So if you solve this tiny little piece, well, that's kind of nice, but sometimes optimizing each of the small pieces gives an inferior result. Optimization of the local does not mean global optimization. And so we should always be thinking of the big picture. What is the final result we care about? And user experience isn't always the most important component. Because take a camera. What's the camera about? All those controls? No. The camera is just a tool to get the real user experience, which is the experience of enjoying the movie, the video, the picture. It's the end result that matters. And so we should be focused upon making it easier for people to get to the end result. We don't have to focus on the details of the tools. Those have to be understandable and usable. But remember, the important thing is the real goal of the people who use our products. Yeah, Don, Don, uh, Don Norman's a great guy, NNG. Um, really good uh, website there to check out. All right, uh, I'm gonna jump over to our last video here, I believe. Let me do a quick uh, quick take. Yep, I think this is our, our, last, our last video here. And then I wanna pass it over to you all to give it a try. Design's a really loaded word. I don't know what it means. And so we don't really talk about design a lot around here. We actually just talk about how things work. Um, most people think it's how they look, but it's not really how they look, it's how they work. I think Steve is a design champion by action, not by talking about design. It's that he's a collaborator, that he really understands design um, not academically, but as a participant. Steve not only is a champion of design, but creates an environment for designers that's conducive to producing terrific work. Everyone says, you know, I want to make a great product, or I want to make a great movie, or whatever they're doing. Uh, so there's no difference there, but there's a big difference in 
the outcomes. When we were developing the new iMac, we were at a point when we had a, a couple of solutions that, I mean, at the time, I think we, yeah, we thought they were good. But we had that sinking feeling, you know, when you start to, you, you, you are aware that you're trying to convince yourself something's actually better than in your heart you really know that it is. Sometimes you just have to look at yourself and go, you know, it's just not really great. It's okay. It's good. But let's not fool ourselves and call it great. Steve really felt that we could do better and we, we all realized we needed to. I mean, that's a hard, hard call to make. You know, we're willing to throw something away because it's not great and try again when all of the pressures of commerce and, and uh, are at your back saying, no, you can't do that. Steve is so much more than a supporter of design. He not only has a very clear sort of sense of vision and sense of the future, but has this sort of um, unnerving ability to describe the future in a way that's very inclusive, in a way that draws people from many different disciplines sort of in to share this sense of what this vision could be. Right, great. Now it's your turn. So I like. Can you name sort of three? There you go. Sorry about that. All right. So I'm going to bring you over here. Uh, so for those of you that have left the board, I'm going to put the link in the chat once more. So for those of you that that didn't get it. Um, uh, once again, you just click on the link, enter as a visitor, no need to enter in your e email or sign up for any account. Uh, but for those of you that wanna participate, I'd like to um, start off with this first board. And all you need to do is click on one of the post notes and just start typing. That's all you have to do, very simple. Click on a post note, start typing. Um, so for this, I'd like for you to um, respond to the question, what are the best things in life for you right now? So this is the best things in life for you right now. We'll spend about a minute on this. And all you have to do is click on a post-it note and just start typing. There you go. I see, I see a couple of you out there, so that's great. What are the best things in life for you now? Maybe it's waking well, up late. Yeah, we can also speak out uh, if you like to, either by putting in the chat window, what's the best thing in life for you now, or you can speak out by unmuting yourself. Thank you, Jane. So I'm not retired personally, but from what I hear, uh, waking up, you know, kind of whenever you want. That might be one of those best things in life right now. Um, traveling. I know my, my father, he's retired. He's really enjoying just being able to get up and go and travel. Like that might be one of those best things. One person said in the chat window, health is the best thing in life for, for me now. Health. Great. Thank you for that. Family. Family. Excellent. When Brian and I have uh, dinner together, he asked me this question. I said, I can sleep in every morning till I naturally wake up. Cool. There you go, sleep in. All right, I know we're almost at time, so I'm gonna jump over to the next one. Uh, and this has to do with, well, what's missing from your life right now? What's missing from your life? Is anything missing? Hair. Yeah. Hair. Hair. Yeah, me too. And that's right now. <laughs> Hair. Okay, I'll, I'll put that one for you. What else is missing in your life right now? Order. Some... Order. Great. What else? I like that one. <laughs> Double for order. And um, I guess uh, for me, sometimes energy. 
Energy. Okay, great. Anything else, anybody? Co-worker. Family. Family, yeah. All right, and then this is the, the last activity and I'll reveal it. What does the next best year look like for you? What does the next best year look like for you? Traveling. Excellent, traveling. What else? Breathing. Breathing, all right. In ability to live comfortably. Continuing to tune in to Senior Planet offerings. <laughs> I was not paid for that. <laughs> awesome. All right. Anything else? Anybody? All right. Well, that was great. That was great. So we did some design thinking here. This is as simple as it could be. It's all about asking really good questions. So, you know, the, this was my attempt to ask some questions that have been on my mind. Um, you know, some of the things that I'm working on myself, like I'm trying to be more focused, more deliberate, and I'm using design thinking to design a better life for myself and my family. Um, so I put all the links here in the chat. So if you want to continue your learning, stay curious, stay hungry. Remember, it's all about the outcomes of design thinking, not so much about the process. It's about those outcomes. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, thank you so much um, for your attention and uh, being on this talk today. So I'm going to stop my screen share and pass it over to Jane. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Brian. I really want to thank Brian for today's session. As you can tell, Brian put a lot of energy and preparation in preparing the storyboard, and he's sharing every corner of the storyboard. And I really think that this is such an opening, powerful opening statement and opening class in our demystifying information technology. IT, in the end, at the end of the day, is to solve problem by connecting to the human behavior, human, human attitude and human emotions. So even though we're dealing with ones and zeros, at the end of the day, we're dealing with humans. And again, thank you for joining today. And next Friday, we're going to have another powerful speaker who will speak on UI, which stands for user interface and UX, which stands for user experience. And next Friday, same time, same channel. We look forward to seeing you. Very good. Very good. Thank it you. makes me feel empowered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.